Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, Hank, I, first, first of all, I want to thank you for coming. It, uh, you honor us. It, uh, I should declare right off the bat that I'm a friend of Hank's. I've been so for some years. I admired him when he, before he took the job, I admire him a lot more after the job he's done as Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, the name of this book is On the Brink, and that's exactly where we were in September and October of 2008. At that time, uh, our, our economy, uh, our financial world went into cardiac arrest, and we had four people in the operating room that we were very fortunate as a country to have in place. We had, we had Hank, we had Ben Bernanke, we had Tim Geithner, and we had Sheila Bear, the head of the FDIC. And I really, I know a lot of people in finance, I know a lot of people in business, I know a lot of people in government, and I can't think of four that would have done a better job of getting us through that. Now, it's, it's kind of fashionable now to look back and pick at one little aspect or another of what was happening then, but our country's financial system froze up during that period. Uh, some of you in this room were at a party I was at in September of 2008 when the talk was our money market fund safe. Now, when you have 3.5 or more trillion of funds held by 30 million people who on a Sunday night are worrying about whether they can get their money. That, that, that money was half of all the deposits held by U.S. banks at the time. Uh, you have a panic. You had commercial paper freeze up entirely, and you had some of the biggest companies in the United States, and some of them are described in this book, that worried about whether they were going to meet their payrolls in a short period of time. You had the sixth largest bank in the country in terms of demand, uh, domestic deposits, Washington Mutual fail over a weekend. You had the third largest bank, Wachovia, that uh, needed a shotgun marriage on a Monday morning to survive. Uh, most interestingly, this book starts uh, in early September when F Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae essentially were broke. Uh, here are two institutions that guaranteed 40% or so of all the residential mortgages in the United States, whose debt was held all over the world in, in very significant amounts, including by go foreign governments that would not have taken kindly to a default, uh, Freddie and Fannie. Uh, you had them owning a very large portfolio of, of mortgages themselves. And like I say, in early September, uh, they both were broke. It's worth noting for those who who uh, take shots at some of the people who were operating uh, during September and October, that those two institutions, Freddie and Fannie, were chartered by Congress and were ruled by Congress. And for those who have heard them uh, criticize the leverage uh, in the banking system, it should be also noted that they allowed Freddie and Fannie to operate with a 40 to 1 leverage ratio, and they let them guarantee over 100 times the amount of capital they had uh, in, in mortgage guarantees. Uh, so these two institutions, which were vital to the mortgage market, were vital to the very integrity of the United States, uh, and which had received, in this complicated Hanks problem, in a very short period before September, the watchdog agency that Congress had established to watch these two agencies had given them a clean bill of health. And uh, that clean bill of health uh, it might be fun to go back and read that now. Well, let's get on to Hank's book. And, uh, uh, you know, when I, when, I, when I got this book, I got a little early, and, and uh, uh, I expected to learn a lot about the financial crisis, and I did. But I didn't realize that uh, I'd also learned something about how to attract women. Uh, it's a little late, I realize, but, but uh, Hank had a... Uh, had a surefire, a surefire approach, which, when he took Wendy out on his first date, on their first date in Boston, I would, I would like you to describe it. If you even want to elaborate on it a little bit, Hank, I'd like to hear about it. 
<laughs> let, let me say before I do that, Warren, first of all, I'm just delighted to be here today in Omaha. If you had another foot of snow, it would be just like Washington. And uh, again, uh, I've been a longtime friend and admirer of Warren's, and he was a, just a real pillar of, uh, of strength and a source of strength for me during the credit crisis. You know, w Warren was referring to to, to something in, in, in the book. I, I was not a model of maturity when I was a, a, a senior at Dartmouth College. And I had my, my first date with Wendy, we were at the Boston Pops, and she wasn't very impressed when I made my program into a paper plane and sailed it at Arthur Fiedler. So, but, but I... <laughs> Did you hit him? I, I, no. 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 <laughs> no. And it, it, it did, but she, she gave me another chance. But didn't she go home early that night? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. She went, uh, she went home early that night. Yeah. And so, but fortunately, he got, he got a second chance. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, and Hank, tell us a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, Hank's a, he says in the book, he says, I'm, you know, I'm a tough guy. I forget where, he, <laughs> at what point you said that. But he also, he was a wrestler at high school. He was all Ivy at Dartmouth as a tackle and everything. But when the president, asked him to become Secretary of the Treasury, uh, and Hank's initial reaction was not to do it, but, but he decided to do it. But he had one big worry, and I think it, this crowd might be interested in knowing what makes a grown man tremble. <laughs> well, it was, uh, w w Warren is talking about my mom, and I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, uh, quite close to my mother. She's a strong woman. She's very engaged and interested in politics and policy. and. And, and she was not an admirer of, of, of George Bush and very unhappy with the war and uh, very interested in women's issues and so on. And so there, there had been a fair amount of speculation in the press that I might go to Washington. And I had turned down the opportunity a, a, a couple of times and I had assured her that I w was not going to go because I had no intent of going. And, but then when I had r reversed myself and decided very suddenly it was, it was the right thing to do not to say no to my country. I was in Barrington, Illinois, where we, where we live and still have our primary residence, and I was there on Memorial Day weekend because the president was going to make the announcement on the Tuesday after Memorial Day weekend, so I was going to see my mom. Unfortunately, at church, we were at church together, I had a longtime friend uh, ask me about what I was doing next, and I told her. And, of course, she went up to my mom and said, isn't this great, Marianna? And mom didn't think it was great. So when I, when I arrived up to tell my mom, she already had known about it. And she was, and I didn't see her sob much, but she was sobbing and very angry, angry and crying. And it said to me that I'd started with Nixon and now I was going to end up with Bush and I deserved everything I got. And that, and 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 that I was jumping on a sinking ship, but I, I will say, I will say this though, and in, in, in the end, I, I say that by the time I finished in Washington, my mother had a had a different president, a different opinion of George W. Bush, but, but it was a, it's not a good way to start off, and and Wendy wasn't much happier with me. So, <laughs> Hank, one of the most interesting things I found in the book, and I'd not heard a word about this before, was. Uh, your account of how the, some top Russian officials had gone to some top Chinese officials with the suggestion, essentially, that they start dumping uh, the bonds of probably Freddie and Fanny at that time. Uh, and, and that almost sounds like a bear raid. I mean, I thought that was the sort of thing that just the evil guys in Wall Street did. But it, tell me about that. Well, well it, it, it never happened. And, but we were very very concerned about stabilizing Fannie and Freddie because, as Warren said, there's $5.4 trillion of securities that were either insured or issued directly by these institutions. And they are highly levered institutions, and these securities were held, I think, about $1.7 trillion outside of the U.S. The biggest portion was inside the U.S., and we had gone. I, I'd been trying to get uh, reform legislation from Congress beginning in 2006 and to get the kinds of reforms we needed, but we were unable to get action until they were just on the edge. And so we were able to, to, to go to Congress, get the, get the authorities, 
and then as we needed to really spend time poring over their books, understanding the, the financial situation. Well, I had, in the book, uh, I recount that I was in China for the, for the Olympics, and there I had, uh, I, it was given to understand that the Chinese had been approached by the Russians with, with uh, a suggestion that maybe they, that they, could, they could sell some of the securities together maybe to test our resolve who, who knows who knows why but that that they got why, my, why do you think why, do you, why, why well, I, I would say that would be pro probably to just I, I don't know why but we'd had so many conversations with the russians the chinese and everyone else i just knew that just the just any kind of of sudden selling would have really spooked the markets and i would say it it, it never happened but it was a, you know, when some people say to me, well, just about everything bad that could have happened did happen, I say, not quite. It, it <laughs> felt that way sometimes. But, you know, we, I, I worried about, a, you know, the possibility of a sudden decline in the dollar or, or you know, other things that, that never happened. And one of the biggest concerns I had was getting Fannie and Freddie stabilized. And in a sense, we tell the story of how very suddenly we put them into conservatorship, which was essentially guaranteeing their debt, because it was, it was in essence, an implicit obligation by the United States of America. It was sort of like the, the banks had their sieves and conduits, were, which were off balance sheet and with implicit guarantees. Well, that was a little bit like what Fannie and Freddie were. And we were racing against time to stabilize those before we knew some bad earnings were going to be coming out from the banking sector and particularly uh, uh, the Lehman Brothers losses. So that was a race against time and I was fortunate, we were fortunate that we were able to get it done without the markets becoming spooked or unsettled. So that's why I was, you know, what, why that, what I'd heard in, uh, in China got my full attention.